Good morning, everybody. This is Bernardo Cortese from Milano, Clinica San Carlo. I'm going to chair this session on this new technology, this new sirolimus coated uh, technology with the solution DCB. This is my potential conflict of interest. So what is important now is to underline uh, uh, um, the new technology which helps us to improve the quality of our PCIs. With a solution DCB, we have a DCB which eludes sirolimus at uh, a, a low dosage, one microgram per millimeter square of the surface of the balloon. But uh, the difference here with other uh, different brands is that uh, the release of the sirolimus is uh, um, uh, adjuvated by a new technology which is called CAT and which helps the uh, correct deliverability of the drug into the vessel wall with a membrane which is delivered upon balloon inflation. And then sirolimus persists in the vessel wall for up to three months like uh, some animal studies are showing. So this is important for us in order to have the drug with a controlled release for the first months after PCI. I have nothing to tell you about uh, the properties of sirolimus and the wide uh, therapeutic window uh, and its safety. So what we want to see now is the performance of this new device for our complex daily uh, clinical patients. So the objectives of this uh, webinar are to understand how sustained limus release technology can broaden the use of DCB in our daily practice. And then we want to learn how solution SLR sustained limus DCB performs in our everyday clinical practice, thanks to the improved deliverability and trackability of this device. We want to understand uh, which are the problems that we currently face with drug eluting stents and if we want to have something different uh, in order to uh, optimally treat our patients because we want to avoid the full metal jacket and in some cases we want to leave nothing behind to our patients. So this is the first case that we did a few months ago. It's a very highly complex patient with a, a stable angina and we managed to treat this patient not only by a DCB the strategy, but we use a DCB just where the side branch were there and we didn't want to risk to close them. So we did a hybrid, full hybrid therapy. And this was the final result, which was actually maintained after four months uh, when the patient came back. Today, we will have three experts which will show us how uh, solution SCB is uh, used in their daily practice. We'll have Dr. Mashayeki with a live in a box, followed by Dr. Rissanen, which will help us to understand the dilemma if to use a stent or not, and Dr. Hanner, which will help us to understand when and how we should use a hybrid therapy with drug eluting stent and sirolimus uh, coated balloon. Thank you and enjoy our webinar. Ciao. So hello, uh, it's a great honor for me to talk about uh, CTO interventions and how to avoid a full metal jacket uh, during CTO PCI. And um, those are my conflict of interests. Well, <clears throat> what we actually know is that uh, once we're putting a lot of stents in, a stent length more than 60 millimeters, then the uh, rate of target lesion failure is going high up to 16%. This is an analyze over 1,100 patients and 36% went uh, underwent a full metal jacket. And, uh, and the predictors actually for the target vessel failure were the number of stents, but also persistent distal lumen narrowing. And this was uh, um, in a univariate, but also in a multivariate analysis, highly significant. So, uh, what's also known actually from the present three and uh, four uh, uh, trial is that uh, patients who are stented after CTO have higher rates of target vessel revascularization compared with those who are not treated uh, uh, despite the remaining disease. And here you can see a difference between 18% versus 8% regarding instant 
restenosis once you put a stent in. And it's interesting that still, even if the stenosis distal, the band of a CTO are more than 50% and you uh, try to treat this with a stent that you might end up with about uh, to 80% with instant restenosis in this trial. Compared to those who are non-treated at all, in, the, in this collective, actually, uh, the instant restenosis rate is lower. So that, that brings us to the thought, actually, <clears throat> and uh, about what can we do as an alternative to reduce instant restenosis. And uh, the basket two, small, uh, basket 2 trial actually showed that it's feasible also in lesions with lower than 3 millimeter to, uh, do, uh, to make a drug eluting um, balloon implantation actually this, uh, versus a drug eluting stent and the maze rate was not uh, different in both arms. So uh, what is, I think, very important once we think about uh, doing a, um, uh, yeah, a optimization regarding drug eluting balloons or even a stent or hybrid therapy is also to have intravascular imaging. <clears throat> well, intravascular imaging helps you to, to see and a huge dissection or big dissection distal to stent, uh, true protrusion in the stent, but for sure also malopposition. So this is very important to have an understanding of the disease in the vessel. And what we know is that intravascular imaging actually can reduce a maze rate in CTO PCI. And this was shown already in 2015, where the combined endpoint uh, was reduced uh, with uh, IVUS guided PCI compared to angiography guided PCI. And also in um, lesions and complex uh, PCI where we need longer stents, more than 28 millimeters, there was a clear message that um, I was guided PCI has a long, a lower uh, uh, primary combined endpoint. It was cardiac death, TLR, and TLR related myocardial uh, infarction compared to uh, angiographic guided PCI. And well, the trivia was almost a TLR, which could be significantly reduced. This was a huge trial of 1,400 patients. We were randomized. So this, uh, what I want to share with you is a live in a box case, actually what I recorded and um, <clears throat> where you see a CTO of an LED and uh, there is disease, diffuse disease. And uh, we did a retrograde crossing ipsilateral. My colleague, Mohamed Ayub was with me. I could pass with a filter XT wire directly into the anti-grade guide and I could bring the micro catheter up and then do a tip in. And finally, we had an anti-grade wire and now we were thinking about the strategy for stenting. Well, the complete part of the complete occlusion has the highest burden of uh, disease. Here, we decided to use a stent uh, because uh, the OCT uh, was not, uh, uh, we, we couldn't see anything because the, the flow was, was uh, uh, reduced. And we did also a stent proximal uh, because there was a high uh, calcified lesion. So then we run the OCT because of the distal band. And what we have seen here, <clears throat> pardon me, actually was that the distal uh, vessel looked not bad. Here were some disease for sure. And here was um, also, you might see, it's a little bit uh, 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 yeah, diseased here, the vessel. And here you see uh, calcium also. Here calcium is coming. It's a 180 degree of calcification, as you can see here. And there is a remaining dissection directly at the end of the stand. Nevertheless, we decided for a solution, a drug eluting balloon uh, with a, a serolimus platform um, with a 30 millimeters to save a stand plank. And this is the balloon here, as you can see it. And <clears throat> we will show you the angiographic result and also the OCT result. Here is the primary angiographic result with a TIMI free flow uh, with a remaining dissection. Um, which is not very good visible on angiography, but you will see it on OCT. So here is the section distally, as you can see. There is a rel relatively good uh, lumen, but already small dissection there. And going up, here is the 180 degree of calcium. And even with we used only four to six atmosphere, there was still a remaining dissection uh, distal of the stand. The stand itself was expanded very, very well. And um, I think it's a nearly perfect stand result. <clears throat> so the question is here, should we put a stand or not? I want to be provocative here and tell you that once you have a timid free flow 
And uh, um, like here, uh, in a CTO vessel with a diffuse disease, and you might end up probably 40 to 60 millimeter more stents, it's really worth try it with a drug eluting balloon primarily because their long-term outcomes actually are not bad. For sure, we need further studies for this uh, hybrid approach, that's uh, clear. But what you can see here, that the primary result is very good, and we have to bring the patient back for re-angio. He, he felt very good and no troponin elevation the next day. So taken together, the number of stents and distal lumen narrowing were independent predictors for target uh, vessel failure in full metal jacket CTO lesions over 60 millimeter drug eluting stents. That's what we know. Drug eluting balloons should to be effective as drug eluting stents in the de novo lesions, smaller than three millimeter in the basket two study. I think imaging-guided CTO-PCI has shown clear that they, it's possible uh, with uh, image-guided CTO to reduce hot clinical endpoints. That has been shown already in 2015. And whenever an increased use of drug-eluting balloon combined with imaging in CTO-PCI may reduce TLR, has to be improved by further studies. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, welcome everybody. Hi, Cambis. Uh, great presentation. Thank you for showing us uh, the use of uh, solution DCB for uh, a complex CTO, retrograde CTO. Um, I would like to ask uh, if the panel has any type of question on, on this case, because I have one that I would like to ask you. Okay, so I, I go on. I go on with this question. Uh, Cambis, you are an expert either in DCB and in CTO management. So my question is, do you think that uh, DCB can be can have a, a smart future for the use uh, for its use in CTO in reducing uh, the DS uh, uh, length in this type of lesion setting because we know that we want uh, to avoid a too long too long stance in this setting. Okay, I know that you do this such cases. We do such cases, but uh, only a few of CTO experts are using DCB in the in this field. Do you think that in the future, especially with a new device like the solution with a sustained release? of Cirolimus, there could be an advantage for, for the treatment of CTOs? Well, uh, thanks, Bernardo, for the question, actually, and it's an important one. Um, and uh, this, that makes me, in general, the question makes me thinking about uh, trial design and also uh, what we have to compete with. And uh, we have to compete with ultra-thin drug-eluting stents uh, nowadays, uh, but nevertheless, uh, especially uh, data showing us that uh, very long stent length are associated with higher TLR. So the question is, uh, how can we predict a, a low TL TLR rate uh, with uh, drug eluting balloons? And uh, therefore, this brings me again to two points which are important. One is uh, the right plaque modification tools and, and uh, to really modify the plaque before uh, uh, putting the drug. And this uh, 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 is uh, directly connected with intravascular imaging. So. Um, if you ask me uh, um, what is going on in future, what is going on now, what I would like to have is I would want to better understand at which point actually uh, regarding which criteria do I need in uh, um, HD IVUS or OCT to be safe and uh, for the patient also uh, regarding long-term outcome with only drug eluting balloon. I mean, we know that in smaller vessel, like in the basket two trial, it works. Uh, but as you have seen here in my case, there was still a remaining dissection. We know that end edge dissection of stents can even lead to instant thrombosis. And, uh, and uh, this was not a flow limiting dissection, but at which point, I mean, it turns into a higher risk uh, of, for the patient. And uh, so therefore we have really to calculate the, the risk and uh, benefit of remaining dissection uh, and uh, also to, to, uh, regarding the, the opposite to safe stand length. So uh, uh, at this point, uh, we don't have clear answer for this question at the moment. Okay, and thank you for your clear answer on this. So we need to work, we need to also to design some mechanistic study on this setting and to see which device will be the best solution for our patients. For the sake of time, uh, we will go on with Thomas Rissanen, which uh, uh, has a recorded lecture on how DEB only strategy for complex lesion changing the treatment paradigm. Dear colleagues and friends, um, I'm very happy to share a couple of complex cases treated with uh, DCP only strategy with you uh, and especially with the Limus release DEB. 
these are my uh, disclosures. The first patient is a 65 years old male. He has hypertension, type 2 diabetes, hypercholesterolemia, and anticoagulation for chronic AFib. He presented with uh, stable CCS2 symptoms and diagnostic coronary angiogram revealed a CTO lesion in uh, RCA. Elective uh, PCI of the CTO lesion was planned, and this is the bilateral contrast. You can see that the lesion is, is quite long, but there is a, a microchannel inside of it. And uh, therefore, a undergrade wire escalation was the initial <coughs> strategy, and uh, we were able to pass this lesion with a uh, fielder XDA wire quite easily. However, in the B bot, there was a possible uh, sub-indimal wiring of the, of the lesion, which may have an impact in the uh, outcome in this patient. This is the uh, result after braid lattation with a 3.0 NC balloon, all the way the, the vessel from the distal part to the uh, ostium. And because this fulfilled the uh, international consensus guideline criteria for DCP only treatment, we applied uh, three very long uh, drug eluding uh, balloons. The first, more, uh, most distal one, was the solution limus uh, eluding balloon, and then two uh, paclitaxel eluding balloons. And the reason for the mixed uh, balloons was that we didn't have enough very long balloons uh, in the self. Uh, the patient was NOAC, and uh, we, we uh, found this uh, DCP-only uh, <clears throat> strategy very beneficial because we avoided the full metal jacket in this, in this patient. This is the uh, final result of the vessel. You can see that the flow is, is normal. Uh, there is no uh, significant recoil, a little bit uh, dissection, which is no non-flow uh, limiting in the B part. And it's, it's very important to <clears throat> have uh, also a different view, showing that there's no problem in the vessel. And also the uh, AP view is, is very nice in these uh, uh, DCP only lesions where you can very nicely see if there is a problem in the, in the vessel. In the control angio, you can see that treated RCA was uh, uh, enlarged in size due to positive remodeling of the vessel. However, there was a, a spot in the P part where is a, a restenosis um, evident. <clears throat> we did uh, OCT run in this patient, and uh, uh, in the upper left corner, you can see the uh, part where uh, solution balloon was uh, treated. The vessel has healed. Um, of course, you have to bear in mind that this was the distal disease of the vessel and not uh, the occluded part. And then uh, on the right uh, corner, there's a, a part where is stenosis evident. Um, and then <clears throat> the paclitaxel treated parts. And it's very important to notice the size of the vessel, which is it's actually very large, up to uh, 4.3 millimeters. And um, uh, we believe that this uh, subintimal wiring could have an have an impact on the on the uh, focal restenosis in this uh, patient. We fixed this uh, restenosis with uh, a stent because uh, we did also a bread uh, lattation again, but there was a recoil, so uh, the lesion need, needed to be stented. Although uh, we were very happy to uh, see that uh, only uh, 12 millimeter stent was uh, finally used in this in this very long long lesion. The second patient is a 74 year old male, uh, hemodialysis for uh, renal disease heart failure, hospitalization, and uh, very importantly, had anemia uh, at the time of presentation. Coronary angiogram re revealed a significant distal left main uh, stenosis, Medina class uh, 101, and uh, also uh, you can see that the osteal cirque is, is significantly uh, diseased. But the proximal LAD was actually uh, fine. You can see it here. And uh, because of this calcium, uh, we decided to have uh, upfront uh, rotablation using two uh, different size burrs, 1.5 and 2.0. 
And after that, prelatation was performed with a, a 4.0 cutting balloon. And this is the result after prelatation. Uh, there's a little uh, dissection seen in the circ, but the uh, flow is good and, uh, and the left main looks nice. Due to uh, high bleeding risk in this patient and also uh, not to uh, endanger the, the uh, osteal lady, we decided to uh, uh, apply solution DCB in, in this uh, lesion, covering both the lady, uh, pardon me, uh, left main and the circ lesions. This is the <clears throat> uh, final result. And you can see that the uh, circ is, is fine a little bit uh, non-flow limiting dissection and uh, no problem in the uh, LAD. We found that it's very important in this case uh, as well to have a control angio and this is uh, the situation five months later. Uh, there is no restenosis in the, in the left main or in the uh, osteal circ, which looks very nice. And also LAD, osteal LAD, is, is still uh, okay. So I would like to conclude that DEP or DCP only strategy for the novel is safe and efficient as shown by the recent uh, randomized trials, but it's also feasible in complex lesions after rotational atherectomy or even in uh, CTO in cases where you can have a lumen to lumen uh, wiring. And finally, limus alluding DEB is a novel option for the stainless PCI. I would like to thank, thank you for your attention and ready for questions. Thank you, Thomas, for having shown these uh, such <laughs> complex cases. I would say extremely complex cases with extreme uh, uh, indication for, uh, for a DCB, but we know that uh, uh, you, you have a long-term experience uh, before with Paclitaxel, uh, in, in this uh, se lesion setting, but also in the complexity of the patient, uh, for example, the high bleeding risk patient. Uh, so the key messages of your presentations, in my, in my opinion, uh, uh, are dual. The first one is that you have to achieve uh, a perfect uh, uh, lesion preparation, and you did it uh, with uh, all of the devices that we may use, uh, rotablation in the second case uh, and uh, uh, aggressive predilatation in the first one. The second message, which I would like to underline from the second case, is that uh, in that particular position, you avoided putting metal, uh, which could uh, in some way hamper a perfectly uh, um, uh, spared uh, osteal LAD. So by means of using uh, just uh, delivering the drug, uh, you avoided this, and you did correctly an angiographic follow-up to see if there was a restenosis. So can you comment on this? Yes, thank you, Bernardo. Uh, very good points. And uh, um, yeah, we have done uh, almost 3,000 uh, PCI using DCP only uh, strategy in our cath lab during the uh, past years. And uh, we have found that, especially the frail patients, high bleeding risk patients, uh, benefit from this. And uh, uh, in the uh, second case, the patient was actually in hemodialysis, uh, had anemia in the presentation. And as we achieve a stent-like result after rota and predilatation with a cutting balloon, uh, we found that there is no sense to put a stent in this patient, but treat it with a solution. And uh, we quite often have control anxious, especially those in, in CTO cases, uh, to see the, the good result because, the, as you know, the data is limited at this point. So we have to gain experience and uh, of course, have uh, good trials in the future. Yeah. Any comment by Jonas on these cases? Yeah, well, it's it's, it's really interesting how uh, you can do, well, even left main PCIs with just drug-coated balloons. This is impressive and it, well, needs, uh, well, uh, power to do that also in a case. Um, I will later on present the case where the, the hybrid uh, management um, but if you have in, in one side branch or in the main branch some days section, would you be um, very aggressive in, in changing your treatment strategy or would you try to, to stay on DCB? Thomas. Yes, uh, very good question. We uh, keep all the uh, ways open until the end and we, we have to 
uh, keeping in mind in uh, the clinical aspects of the patients, the bleeding risk, uh, the threshold for standing is, is uh, uh, in fact lower if you have a young patient, uh, healthy patient, but it's, it's higher if you have a frail uh, bleeding risk patient. Uh, in, in bifurcations, uh, side branch is, is a very good target for DCB, but also the, the main vessel, if it's uh, uh, the result of the pretladation is fine, there is no recoil uh, over 30%, uh, the flow is Dimitri. So we have uh, found that there, there will be no problems in that vessel later on. Occlusion rates are really low. They are 0.2% of the DCP only strategy. Yeah. Uh, well, I want to underline one point. I think that uh, we need to do this. Uh, we are not claiming that we should use uh, such a new device in such uh, a complex setting. Uh, because you know that solution came out uh, one year ago. The clinical program just started. Uh, it is very ambitious. Uh, it will cover all of the coronary lesion settings that uh, we face, uh, uh, starting with instant restenosis and de novo lesions with very large trials. We will see the results uh, in the next few years, obviously. And so uh, the message is not, okay, we should use this new device also for left main, but... Uh, uh, in everyday, everyday practice, uh, we have to face with very complex patients like the one that Thomas just presented with high bleeding risk, dialysis, and so. So we don't have just uh, to think how to put the metal there, but there is also an alternative. And drug water balloon or drug eluting balloon, however you want to call it, uh, is a good alternative. Okay, so we are perfectly on time. So uh, I would like to present you the last lecture the last lecture of this session, which is uh, uh, done uh, by uh, Jonas. It is combining DES and DCB, a hybrid treatment. So this is one of the most important and interesting settings uh, where a DCB can be used in my, in my personal view. Dear audience, I'm Jonas Handler, interventional cardiologist uh, at the Bern University Hospital in Switzerland. It is my privilege to present you two cases under the topic uh, combining drug eluting stents and drug eluting balloons as a hybrid treatment strategy with sustained lemus release drug eluting balloon. I have nothing to disclose. I will show you two different cases with the hybrid treatment strategy where I used the combination of drug eluting stents and drug eluting balloons. The first was a left main trifurcation where I chose a drug eluting balloon for the treatment of a side branch to avoid three stent left main trifurcation PCI. The second one was a patient with multifocal small vessel disease with two almost identical lesions in two different posterolateral branches, where I would like to show you how I tailor device choice according to the result after predilation. The first case with a left main trifurcation was a 61 year old man two years ago due to progressive asthma, he quit smoking and started cycling. One day, however, while cycling, he had an inferior STEMI uh, we diagnosed three vessel disease, initially recanalized the thrombotic RCA occlusion and uh, got him back to the cat lab six weeks later for stage PCI of the left coronary artery. At the time of stage PCI, this is what the RCA looked like. Ejection fraction was slightly reduced. And this was the reason for the reangiography six weeks later. This was the left coronary artery. We had a significant left main shaft stenosis, high-grade stenosis of the intermediate branch, significant circ stenosis and diffuse disease of the LAD. LAD had an RFR of 0.88, which was significant. We did not do FFR due to the asthma. We offered surgery to the patient, but uh, he insisted on percutaneous treatment. Planning OCT confirmed diffuse disease of left main and LAD. We had a minimal lumen area of less than five millimeters square in the left main. We had significant disease at the side of the left main bifurcation and LAD had calcified segments as well as lipid rich segments. So what was the approach uh, to this left main trifurcation? The European Bifurcation Club proposes to keep 
bifurcation stenting simple and safe. So I think this also uh, can be considered for trifurcations to try to limit the number of stents used and to aim for well-opposed and well-expanded stents with limited overlap, which may be difficult if we treat this trifurcation. So my plan was to simplify trifurcation to a bifurcation by avoiding uh, intermediate branch stenting. So step one would to first predilate and treat the intermediate branch with a drug eluting balloon, and then to proceed with left main bifurcation PCI. And this is what I did. I first predilated the intermediate branch with a 2-0 compliant balloon after confirmation of a, a good result with less than 30% residual stenosis in the absence of relevant dissection. I applied a 2-0 20 millimeter solution SLR drug eluting balloon for 60 seconds. And this is the result thereafter. I could confirm a good flow and no relevant dissection. Thereafter, I proceeded with the treatment of the left main bifurcation. Uh, keep it simple here. Uh, I used a long stand from the left main to the mid LAD and then second stand to the circ, followed by pot kissing balloon and OCT guided correction of residual malaposition. This is what we had at the end. OCT of the left main and LAD showed a good result in all segments. And we had a very minimal double layer segment at the site of the distal left main bifurcation. Angiography showed that the intermediate branch was still perfused. And the patient uh, was discharged the following day on aspirin and ticagrelor. And follow up six months later, unfortunately without angiography was uneventful. In my second case, that was a 70-year-old man with history of posterior STEMI, PCI of the CERC and LID one month ago. He now presented for stage PCI of the posterior lateral branches. Those uh, were almost identical lesions uh, in, and affected small vessels. When considering the use of drug eluting balloons for the treatment, um, Two points are important. First, we need an optimal predilation. And second, we need to assess the result after predilation before we proceed. Predilation may require speciality balloons or further equipment if necessary. And once we have an acceptable angiographic result with no flow limiting dissection and less than 30% residual stenosis, we can consider uh, proceeding with drug eluting balloon. Otherwise, in case of suboptimal angiographic result, we should prefer drug eluting stent. In my case, I used a 2-0 compliant balloon for the predilation of both lesions here. In the second posterior lateral branch, I had an acceptable result without relevant uh, residual stenosis, while in the first posterior lateral branch, uh, the, the result was suboptimal with a significant residual stenosis. Accordingly, I used a drug eluting balloon for the second posterior lateral branch and a drug eluting stent for the first one with a good final angiographic result. And the patient came back uh, one week ago for a planned reangiography six months after, and we still have a good result and a good runoff in both lesions. To summarize, I showed you two different cases where I combined drug eluting stents and drug eluting balloons with sustained lemus release. The first case, uh, to avoid three stent trifurcation PCI, I first treated the side branch with a drug eluting balloon. Reduction in PCI complexity may result in a better stent geometry and the remaining bifurcation by, uh, with a lower risk of stent failure and sustained lemus release may improve long-term patency of side branches. And the second case was to illustrate uh, how I guide the decision whether to use the drug eluting stent or a drug eluting balloon according to the result after predilation. Uh, drug eluting balloon should only be considered in cases where we don't have flow limiting dissection and the less than 30% residual stenosis after predilation. Thank you for your attention. Great, great, Jonas. So uh, also, these, these two cases which you just presented uh, show uh, an important message that uh, I would like to underline. 
which is that uh, when you when you do a PCI, uh, this is uh, uh, what uh, we believers in DCB want uh, uh, that uh, uh, all of the audience uh, uh, will come back home with this message, is that uh, you should change your mindset. Uh, you don't have to think of how to accommodate a stent. You have to prepare the lesion, which is also important in the complex lesion setting with the ES. Okay, you prepare the lesion, then you may decide. If you don't have a good lesion preparation, you can go on with a stent because uh, uh, modern stents, uh, as uh, Cambis already said, are safe. So we may use them, we have to use them every day. But if the lesion preparation is okay in a de novo lesion setting, you go, may go with a true, good drug coated balloon like the solution and the result will be very good. So this is an important message. Uh, are there questions by, from the audience on these cases? I could ask Jonas, if, if I may, um, when you are treating uh, citrons uh, with uh, DCP, do you apply the DCP before stenting the main branch or after it? Yeah, this is a very good question. Thank you. Um, I, I think it depends also a bit on the complexity of the lesion. I mean, in a trifurcation, like in the first case, I decided to first uh, treat or at least predilate the side branch and see how it looks like after predilation and also after application of the drug eluting balloon to still have the chance to, to step up to a more complex stent-based uh, treatment. However, in, in more easy lesions like, like bifurcations, um, it may be a consideration to just predilate the side branch, treat the main branch, and then come back with a drug coated balloon in the side branch, which uh, may have the advantage that uh, we don't have to manipulate again with another wire or, or uh, um, even even with the stent balloon uh, due to the proximity of the applied uh, drug coated balloon. Yeah, because one consideration could be that uh, if you stent the main branch first, uh, it could be difficult to uh, have uh, the, the DCP delivered in the side branch, and also that some of the truck may rip off the uh, of the balloon. Yeah, yeah, I think that you are right, Thomas. Um, unfortunately, we don't have uh, uh, data on this setting uh, because uh, uh, some some bench test data probably would be would be good for us in order to understand if also after the dilatation of the side branch, uh, there is the risk of uh, losing some drug. So this is, uh, this is an important point in my opinion, but uh, we have no data on this. Um, I would like to ask you, I don't know if Cambis uh, is uh, still there. Yes, I'm here. I cannot... okay. Yeah, I'm okay, here. Sorry. I couldn't see you. Uh, I have a question for you, Cambis, uh, and, uh, and also for uh, um, Jonas. Uh, and Thomas, this is a quite recurrent question, but uh, I think it's a little bit uh, didactical. So I come back to it uh, again. Mm, many physicians are asking, for how long are you uh, doing prolonged antiplatelet therapy with DCB? Okay, so we have some questions, uh, some easy questions uh, with Paclitaxel. Uh, we have seen in several studies, we have several consensus documents uh, claiming this. Uh, so which is uh, your experience uh, with Sirolimus? Actually, uh, what we're doing at the moment is still that in patients with low uh, bleeding risk, we still go on for six months, uh, even if we use a drug eluting balloon. And uh, it depends on if we have higher bleeding risk patients, I think we can reduce this definitely. And, um, but um, I think that um, Thomas in general has more experience as they have done more than 3,000 uh, PCIs with drug eluting balloons, so probably he can tell us a little bit about his clinical experience whenever he, he, he reduced uh, the sh short depth or only go f with monotherapy, so probably he can, can comment on this as well. Thank you, this is a, a very good question. Uh, our practice is to use one month DAPT in, in normal case for elective patients. And uh, of course, for ACS patients, we follow the guidelines. Uh, but in those patients as well, in case of bleeding, you can actually more easily stop uh, DAPT if you haven't stented the vessel. But in, in the extreme risk patients, like a patient going for emergency surgery tomorrow, we may use only a single antiplatelet, either aspirin or cropilocrel. And uh, 
I, I think uh, surgeons like that approach a lot. And uh, in complex cases, we can use um, uh, congregular infusion during the procedure and then stop and continue only uh, single antiplatelet. But this approach is quite extreme. So we only have uh, uh, maybe a couple of uh, dozens of patients per year. So it's not normal for us either. Yeah, I totally agree with you, Thomas. Uh, this is uh, <laughs> something that, uh, that we do as well. In the case of extreme risk of bleeding, we go with single antiplatelet therapy and we have never seen any problem. Because we have to think that uh, we are not putting metal. Obviously, I'm not talking about hybrid therapy patients, but just uh, DCB. Okay. Uh, in these patients, we are not putting metal and the second antiplatelet was invented for uh, the metal addition. Uh, first with bare metal stent and now with drug eluting stent. So uh, also if we cannot claim that we can use only one single antiplatelet uh, for a DCB PCI, but in some very selected cases, we may do this. You have a great experience on this and uh, I'm happy that uh, you share this message to, to the audience. And now I would like to go uh, uh, for another, another question to, to everybody. Uh, which is uh, a, a complex question. I, I don't have a correct answer, but okay, you have a new device, you have uh, a solution uh, with uh, some uh, uh, inherent characteristics that we have seen, um, and you want to design a clinical trial. Okay, so all of you have a good experience with DCBs, you have participated to trials, uh, you have a great experience in the cath lab. So how would you design a new study with this device in order to understand its characteristics? As you all know, I'm uh, interested in uh, HPR patients, so uh, we are actually starting a randomized trial in Finland very soon, where we compare DCP uh, only strategy uh, against stenting in high bleeding risk patients. So I think those patients get the most uh, clinical benefit from this uh, uh, using a short uh, DAPT. But what we need is uh, randomized trials against stenting in the different uh, scenarios, large vessels, small vessels we already have. Uh, but that's my, my point. Yeah, I think the same we need also for the CTO lesions, actually. And I think there, uh, I think we had to start probably with imaging trials to define uh, whenever uh, uh, we, we can use uh, a DEB uh, in combination, especially also with, with, with uh, distal the band where we have diffuse disease uh, vessels. And, um, but I think this uh, might be an imaging endpoint trial, not a clinical endpoint trial, because therefore we would need too much patient. Okay, Jonas, what do you think? Yes, well, I also think it, since it's a new device, uh, first we need the uh, imaging-based uh, trials with imaging endpoints before we go to the very, very broad uh, spectrum of patients. And also um, to, to keep the indications for the trials also a little bit focused on, on, um, on single groups of patients, not to have a, a very biased uh, samosurium of different cases. Okay, so uh, I'm happy <laughs> that we agree also on this point that we don't need now uh, a trial uh, with angiographic endpoints. Okay, well, we need them, but we also need the intravascular imaging because uh, the complexity of the patients that we are facing need to have uh, a, a more profound lesion assessment and final assessment of, of the results that we have obtained. So this is what we need and this is... Uh, uh, um, uh, also agreeable. Then we, the second study that we need to do is a, a randomized clinical trial with uh, clinical endpoints. And this is uh, uh, very important and agreeable, I think. So, yeah, we are, we are at the end of this very interesting session. For the next time, I'm asking Med Alliance to organize a 90-minute session because 45 minutes are really <laughs> too few for, for us to uh, uh, cover all of the topics on this uh, new device which is very interesting uh, considering uh, its characteristics in delivering the serolimus as some, uh, the first studies have shown for the first 90 days uh, after the inflation. I thank you uh, for your attention and I thank uh, all of this uh, extraordinary panel for taking part into this session. Ciao. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye-bye.